Good evening, everyone. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight on behalf of the Dunhuang Foundation. I'm Julia Grimes, the Deputy Director. This is our inaugural lecture in the Art, Environment, and Materiality along the Silk Road series. And I'd like to first of all thank Professor Anne Fong at Boston University, who very kindly and expertly curated the series, um, as well as Aurelia Dopno, who assisted with organizational details. So Anne and Aurelia, thank you on behalf of all of us. It is my great honor tonight to introduce our first speaker, Professor Subhashini Kalagotla. Subhashini Kalagotla is Assistant Professor of Indian and South Asian Art and Architecture at Yale University. She's an art historian of ancient and medieval South Asia. Her research focuses on the many dimensions of sacred architecture, Buddhist, Hindu, and Jain, from the creative resources of its makers to the multi-sensorial experience of its receivers, as well as its intellectual history. Her forthcoming book, Shiva's Waterfront Temples, which will be published in 2022 by Yale University Press, examines constructions of personhood and space in medieval Deccan, India, from the perspective of a range of makers. A second book project, provisionally titled Seeing Ghosts, is interested in the iconographies of death and the afterlife in early Indian Ocean realms. Professor Kaligotla's topic this evening will be the image of the stupa in early Deccan, India. Without further ado, please join me now in welcoming her. Good evening, everyone. And thank you so much, Julia, for that generous introduction. Besides thanking Julia, I'd also like to thank the Dunhuang Foundation um, for this invitation to speak. I'm honored to be the inaugural speaker. So thank you again for, for the invitation. I'm looking forward to being part of these trans-regional conversations. From its earliest days, with this art included fascinating representations of architecture, like this sculpted image on an ornamental gateway of the great stupa at Sanchi, dated to the first century BCE. The scene depicts the Buddha's great departure when, as a young man, he decided to leave the luxuries of palace life and go in search of answers to humanity's suffering. Artists have represented the rich urban world that young Prince Siddhartha left behind with a dense network of rooftops, projecting balconies and turrets on multi-storied constructions. Painted representations of the Jatakas or the previous lives of the Buddha contain lush views of buildings and built worlds. These painted realms give us visions of ornate gateways leading into complex cities and palaces and pavilions and their lavish interiors. What I'm showing you here is a wall painting from the renowned rock cut monastery at Ajanta in the Western Deccan. Buddhist places and Buddhist buildings were also adorned with representations of Buddhism's holiest of holy spaces, that is the stupa. Perhaps no better example can be found than those from the stupa at Amaravati. So here, the stupa itself was covered with images of stupas, thus encouraging some scholars to call such images and by, by such images, I'm talking about the images here on the left, to call such images meta images. My focus today is on one such representation or image of a stupa. This image was the centerpiece of a residence for Buddhist monks in the rock cut monastery at Nasik in the Western Deccan. What I'll argue is that such images held a deep significance for their ancient interlocutors, a significance that cannot be captured by the English term image. For Nasik's Buddhist community, this image of a stupa was not a stand-in or a signifier for a stupa, but was the thing itself. The point is that makers sacralized the very substance out of which they carved the stupa image 
and the monastic spaces at Nasik. They did so by charging the rock with the charismatic form of the stupa, which is the funerary structure par excellence for the remains of the Buddha. This stupa images focal place in the topography of the residence, inscriptional programs and devotional practices and beliefs further contributed to its efficacy, its imminence, and to its perception as an entity with its own independent meaning. Let's now move in for a better sense of the Deccan during the early centuries of the common era. Starting in the second century BCE, rock cut spaces began to be scooped out of mountain and cliff sides for the residence and worship of the Buddhist monastic community. The majority of these spaces, which are typically called caves in popular and even in scholarly parlance, were excavated in the Western Ghats, which is the mountain chain that runs along peninsular India's Arabian seaboard. And you see it on the map here on the left. Though Hindu and Jaina spaces were also built, Buddhist spaces are the most abundant, numbering some 1,000 caves divided across 50 monastic complexes. The proximity and accessibility of these cave monasteries to urban settlements, arteries of commerce, fertile lands, and major waterways was instrumental to the diffusion of Buddhism within the Deccan and beyond. In these excavated monasteries, Buddhist monks lived in square residence halls called viharas and worshiped in apsidal halls or chaityas. So I'm showing you here a schematic map for the um, Ajanta monastery and I've highlighted the worship halls in yellow and you can contrast the worship halls in yellow with the quadrangular or square viharas, which are the residence spaces. And, and we'll keep seeing viharas, so you'll get an idea of what they, what they look like. This next image gives you a better sense of the rectangular Chaitya Hall with a curved end. The focal point of devotions in the Chaitya Hall was a monumental rock-cut stupa. Notice the stone pillars which mark out a path for circumambulation around the rock cut stupa that stands in the hall's curved end. I want to contrast these rock cut stupas which are made of solid rock and carved out of the basaltic rock of the Western Ghats from built or constructed stupas. This image is the great stupa at Sanchi, or this image is of the great stupa at Sanchi, which is believed to inter the relics of the historical Buddha, who is the fate's founder. A, a stupa is a hemispherical stone clad burial mound interring the relics of the Buddha or other Buddhist elder. At the heart of the stupa is a reliquary, like this one, which is from the stupa at Bhojpur, in which are enshrined bone, ash, and other material remains. Worshippers circumambulate the stupa to honor and be close to the Buddha, but they cannot enter the structure as they would a Hindu or Jaina temple. So I've shown you rock cut stupas and I've shown you built stupas, and now take you back to Nasik, to Vihara 3 to consider a bas-relief image of a stupa. This sculpted stupa image is the focal point of Vihara 3. A Vihara, once again, is a square residence hall where monks would have lived and slept. And this one measures 41 feet by 46 feet and is 10 feet high. Nasik itself is a monastic complex in present-day Maharashtra state in the Western Deccan. Here we have 24 caves, so 24 excavated spaces, which were scooped out of a north-facing hill with commanding views of the surrounding countryside. The complex is located eight kilometers southwest of Nasik town, and it's raised about 300 feet above a fertile plain. And the first stage of construction is dated to around 100 CE. As I was saying earlier, um, so we're talking about a place that was built around 2000 years ago. 
Images like this one in Vihara 3 reveal ontological equivalences that contemporaneous makers and the Buddhist community perceived in all likelihood, and which we as modern interpreters of visual imagery might not fully appreciate. Equivalences between the stupa image and the stupa, and between the stupa and the person of the Buddha. I should also note that to the best of our knowledge, relics were unlikely to be associated with stupa images like this one, or even with the rock cut stupas that were the focus of devotions in worship halls. So the fundamental question I'm trying to answer here is what was the stuff or matter that animated and sacralized such images for their first century CE receivers? I'll consider a number of features of this image, its iconography and position in the topography of Vihara III, inscriptional programs, devotional attitudes, and finally, attitudes toward images in early South Asia. Let me begin with the most obvious feature of this image, its iconography. I propose that the decision to quote the form of the freestanding stupa was crucial for enlivening Vihara III's stupa image. It's worth stressing that as containers for the Buddha's relics, stupas were perceived as charismatic buildings with a power of their own. At their most fundamental, stupas are reliquaries. They're stone-clad earthen mounds that enshrine relic caskets within their depths. That this architectural form carried a significance of its own is reinforced by textual accounts and material and aesthetic practices alike. One of the most legendary accounts informs us, if hyperbolically, that Mauryan Emperor Ashoka, who ruled in the third century BCE, distributed the Buddha's relics by building 84,000 stupas across the expanse of the subcontinent. In doing so, Ashoka extended and perpetuated the Buddha's presence on earth and contributed to the faith's remarkable reach in the Indian subcontinent and well beyond. And I should note that um, the great stupa, um, which is what we're looking at, uh, is at its core, has an Ashokan core, um, and, and was built up in, in later centuries. But the stupa is not a religious monument that can be inhabited, and the Buddha's relics are not visible. In fact, devotees venerate the Buddha by circumambulating the stupa, and they do so in accordance with an array of beliefs that recognize parallels between the Buddha and his relics. The relics are, are believed to be pervaded with the same moral qualities as the Buddha and are meant to be treated with the same reverence and devotion as he is. Gregory Chopin explains that, quote, one is to adopt the, it's the same frame of mind toward the relic as to be adopted in regard to the living presence, unquote. Aesthetic practices such as multiplication, miniaturization, and nesting further enhanced and built on the power of the stupa form. Robert Scharf has observed that it's the frame or container that empowers relics for their community of reception, for their audience. Nothing expresses the power of the stupa form more clearly than ancient Gandharan reliquaries. Made in gray schist, rock crystal, Gold and silver, these containers for Buddhist bodily remains took the shape of stupas and were nested, producing startling Russian doll-like sequences of stupas within stupas. In his survey of 406 reliquaries, David Jongward found that gold reliquaries tended to be the smallest and innermost vessel in a nested series. So on the one hand, stupas were built to establish the presence of the Buddha, and his presence was extended through replication in space and through duplicating practices like nesting. On the other hand, this research demonstrates an implicit hierarchy of materials because the most precious materials like gold were reserved for the physical remains of, the, of Buddhist figures. Textual accounts corroborate the nesting practices observed in the material record. 
The 13th century Thupavamsa, for instance, which is a Sri Lankan text in Pali, gives an elaborate account of nested reliquaries for the Buddha's remains. These remains were interred in a sequence of containers and stupas, giving us a dizzying array of stupas within stupas made of yellow sandalwood, red sandalwood, ivory, the seven precious things, gold, silver, diamond, ruby, cat's eye, and crystal. It's with this background in mind about the power of the stupa form for early Buddhist communities that I want us to consider the formal details of Vihara 3's stupa image. The Nasik image is delineated into a cylindrical drum surmounted by a dome. At the top of the drum is a Vedika railing pattern. At the apex of the dome are another railing and an inverted stepped pyramid with a triangular frill, out of which a central parasol and two flanking parasols emerge. Below the parasol pairs and level with the harmika railing are flying celestial figures bearing offerings. Two female figures, possibly yakshis or tree spirits, flank the stupa's base. The Buddhist wheel of law, which is easy to see in the, the schematic that you have on the, on the right, um, it hovers over one of the female figures. A heraldic lion floats above the other yakshi, who joins her palms in a gesture of adoration. The parasols, celestial figures making offerings, and adoring yakshis all reinforce the idea that the sculpted stupa represented a sacred object for the resident monks of Vihara III. Comparisons to built stupas, whose general form and iconography are being quoted here are certainly appropriate. And I want you to recall, of course, the image of the great stupa at Sanchi that we just saw. But just as important are formal relationships with the rock cut stupa occupying the Chaitya Hall at the Nasik Monastery itself, which I'm showing you here on the left. So you see that the parallels between the rock cut stupa and the, the relief stupa are, are striking. A second feature that confirms the stupa's holiness is its arrangement in space and the many ways it conditioned the worshippers' bodily experience. The stupa is centrally located within the vihara, within the residence, on the square residence hall's back wall in alignment with its principal entrance. This entrance itself is framed by another relief image of a gateway or thorna. I want to point out that in order to access a built stupa, a constructed stupa, such as the great stupa at Sanchi, a worshiper would have to pass through a thorna. At Sanchi, we have freestanding stone gateways located at the four cardinal directions. And these demarcate the sacred precinct around the stupa and direct the worshiper toward this funerary monument and its circumambulatory path. So thoranas in Buddhist context function much as doorways do at Hindu and Jaina temples. They signal ritually important thresholds and they delineate sacred space. Whereas both the monastic community and a wide cross section of lay worshippers of all genders flock to pilgrimage stupas such as Sanchi, viharas were intended to be private living spaces for Buddhist monks. Again, Monks slept in the rock cut cells that are arranged around the central court and they gathered for worship and other communal activities in the court. So it's safe to say that the audience for the stupa image in Vihara 3 was potentially more limited than at a great stupa or a mahastupa such as Sanchi. So it's important to consider the monks experience of Vihara 3 and how the spatial configuration of the stupa image shaped that experience. Monks would have approached the vihara along the terrace that extends in front of the caves and would first encounter a porch chiseled out of the rock face. After climbing the steps to the porch, the monk would stand face to face with the thorna incised around the doorway. 
From the vantage point of this threshold, the stupa image is visible, along with yakshis, which are those female figures, and flying celestial figures, the stupa image is the only imagery currently in the, in the shadowy interior, and it's illuminated by light entering the doorway and two windows carved to the doors left and right. Scholars have noticed the formal parallels between the relief thorna at Nasik, the relief gateway at Nasik, and the freestanding gateways at Sanchi. The door jams at Nasik are chiseled in the manner of Thorna columns, and the door lintel is cut in the form of two architraves, which are the horizontal beams that you see here on the right, with the characteristic ribbed and curved ends we see at Sanchi. Buddhist motifs and pan Indian architectural motifs are also, uh, sorry, pan Indian architectural ornaments are also common to the sculptural decor of both doorways. Yet, what we've not considered is the agency of the Nasik Thorna, the Nasik Gateway, and how this in turn augments the power and efficacy of the relief stupa that sits within the residence hall. As with the Sanchi gateways, the materiality of this thorna, of the Nasik thorna, elicits certain responses and actions from worshipers. I draw on Jonathan Hayes' writings on object thinking and his claim that objects encourage, invite, and want actions from beholders. Another valuable assertion is about the inseparability of structure and decoration, or structure and ornament. Neither offers itself to us separately in Hay's words. Accordingly, in the case of Nasik, the relief thorna does not simply embellish the vihara's doorway, but rather works in conjunction with the structure of the doorway and the three-dimensional space in which it is incised. So what I'm saying is that the Nasik thorna encouraged viewers to pause at the doorway its proportions, height, width, and depth of carving, and framing of the entryway further encouraged monks to turn their heads to the left, lift them above to the lintel, then again to the right, and all around the porch. The thorna invited the resident monks to consider the imagery inscribed on its surface, as well as the meaning of that imagery. It prompted notice of the text, which I'll consider very soon, chiseled in bands on the inner walls of the porch and to the left of the doorframe. Some of the images right above head level in the space between the tor Torana's architraves, among them the Bodhi tree, the stupa, and the Buddhist wheel of law must have recalled the faith's bedrock values, refuge in the Buddha and his teachings and the community of monks. Other depictions, like those of amorous couples, which appear to the left and right on the Thorna's columns, may have prompted associations with productivity, fecundity, and well being, eliciting therefore pleasurable sentiments. The two burly male bodies, so I'm talking about these two figures here, invite comparisons to door guardians or the bodhisattva Padmapani, who is the lotus bearing bodhisattva of compassion. Regardless of how these figures were identified, their presence must have reinforced for inhabitants the significance of the threshold at which they stood and the space they were poised to enter. In response, they may have touched their foreheads to the ground in devotion, chanted the Buddhist creed and run their hands upon the doorframe to feel the texture, cut, and relief of the carvings. These transactions with the Thorna may have also evoked recollections of other holy places and other stupas, perhaps even a visit to the Sanchi stupa. Thus the encounter becomes not only about the here and now, but also about other spaces and other temporalities. The point I'm making is that the Nasik Thorna is not all surface, nor, nor is it only a two-dimensional representation of real Thoranas. The spatial organization of Vihara 3 requires the resident to pass through and under a Thorana, albeit the sculpted image of one, in order to access the stupa image. 
And this experience parallels the somatic experience, the bodily experience of worshipers at open air pilgrimage stupas like Sanchi's great stupa. This thorana, the Nasik thorana, operates then like the gateways at Sanchi, intervening in space, acting upon the worshiper, and at the same time acting with the worshiper to shape the environment. What is meaningful is that the thorana extends the presence of the stupa into the space occupied by the worshiper and prepares him for his upcoming encounter with the divine. Inscriptions too were exploited to transform the stone walls of Deccan Viharas and endow spaces with sacrality, power, and authority. Their presence attracted attention and encouraged reflection, eliciting a response even if the writing was illegible or incomprehensible. The material manifestation of epigraphs enhanced the beholder's experience of Vihara III. I'm thinking of such properties as length, scale, legibility, depth of carving, fineness of carving, choice of script, texture of the stone surface, and spatial arrangement. So I'm thinking about all of these features or physical characteristics of inscriptions. These nonverbal qualities of the written word, as Antony Eastman puts it, contributed to the sacred meaning of these spaces in a manner akin to the presence of the thorna and stupa images. Vihara III contains four lithic epigraphs of the royal Satavahanas who control the Deccan from the first century BCE to the third century CE. The epigraphs, name and praise King Gautamiputra Shatakarni, his mother, Queen Balashri, who sponsored the Vihara, and Gautamiputra's successor, King Pulumavi. The scribes chose the east and back walls of the porch to place the Sanskrit and Prakrit language texts, which are not all coeval. The inscriptions refer to the Vihara as the queen's cave, and compare its beauty with the divine mansions on Mount Kailasa. The porch epigraphs inform us about lands donated for the upkeep of the monastic community and date the initial phase of construction and subsequent expansions of the Vihara. Just in case it's not clear, this image on the left is um, showing you part of that inscription. And the inscription again um, is to the left of the main doorway or entryway into the Vihara. And you can see that it's quite clear, it's quite distinct, and, and it's deeply carved. Even if the information transmitted by the epigraphs was inaccessible to all but a few literate, likely male beholders, the writing by its very presence solicited attention. Oleg Grabar brilliantly observed that in Islamic visual culture, quote, writing is the intermediary that makes possible an experience not contained in what is written, unquote. In other words, the viewer's experience need not be limited to pure textuality and apprehending the content of the writing. Adapting this idea for a Deccan Buddhist environment, I propose that the inscriptions in Vihara III solicited the eyes and body to linger on the markings. The text prompted the resident monk to register their disposition in space, observe the precision of carving, and read their shape, size, and arrangement. In fact, Pulumavi's inscriptions engage beholders as they approach the residence hall. The letter's prominent pairing with the sculpted thorana and doorway means that they were intended to be noticed. And in concert with the relief thorana, they engage the individual and, em and emphasize the import of the space as well as the actual doorway. Indeed, many of the inscriptions at Nasik's 24 excavated spaces appear either on the back wall of the porch or to the left or right of the doorway leading from the porch into the cave proper as at Vihara III. 
The point I'm emphasizing is that the epigraphs in this queen's cave, particularly those that frame the doorway, are a means of access into the residence and like the relief thorina, extend the stupa's presence into the porch. Eastman writes that inscriptions that appear at doorways, quote, act as textual introductions, establishing a frame of mind and conditioning the reader before he or she enters the building, unquote. Other evidence confirms that this kind of bodily perception extending beyond the optical sense was a consideration in the placement of epigraphs. Most strikingly, a focal stupa image features in only one other residence at the Nasik Monastery. This is Vihara 10, another royally sponsored Vihara organized into a pillared porch leading to a square residence hall. Here too, a conspicuous royal inscription in large, deeply cut, well-formed letters stages the stupa image within. This is the longest inscription both at the Vihara and at Nasik itself. And it's located on the porch's back wall, as we saw at Vihara 3. At nearly 40 feet and in three parts, the writing occupies the entire length of the wall in the space below the ceiling. The letters in Brahmi script decrease in size in each subsequent part while retaining the same form and distinctness of presentation. The first part features the largest and most deeply incised letters and forms the first three lines of text. The text celebrates the Kshatrapa king Nahapana who reigned during the first century and is a public and enduring record of his gift of lands for the maintenance of the Vihara's residence. I want to suggest that the Vihara's, oh, sorry, I want to suggest that the epigraph's materiality is possibly just as important as its contents. The inscription would have demanded attention through its corporeal manifestation within the cave's topography. Its most striking physical feature is its length, beginning at a height of almost 10 feet and extending across the expanse of the cave. Its position at the threshold of the residence hall and the precision of the lettering were also substantial elements in conditioning residents' response in establishing a state of mind. I want to therefore suggest that the presence of the inscription was intended not only to communicate particular textual information, but also to convey the splendor of the space, the generosity of the gift, and the holiness of the space in which these transactions were being conducted. It's the epigraph's very physicality that embodies these last three meanings. So thus far, I've emphasized how the iconography and spatial location of the stupa image, as well as the materiality of its related epigraphs contributed to its semantic power. I want to turn now to Buddhist devotional practices, particularly to shifts in these practices around the beginning of the common era. In order to better understand how Nasik stupa images were perceived by their contemporaries. But first, it's important to point out that Nasik's Vihara 3 and Vihara 10 were excavated at a time when Buddhist visual culture appeared to avoid anthropomorphic imagery of the Buddha. During the so-called aniconic phase, which lasted at least several centuries after the decease of the Buddha, living humans and supreme beings were not fashioned. Instead, the Buddha was represented and emblematically through such visual devices as parasols, empty seats, and footprints. I'm taking us back to the image that I showed at the beginning of the talk. And it's from the great stupa at Sanchi. It's from one of the, the Thoranas. It's from one of the, the gateways of Sanchi, which by, by now, which by now I hope you know better. And what's striking about the scene, which depicts the Buddha's great departure, his rejection of life in the palace, 
is that he's not represented figuratively. He's not represented anthropomorphically. So these are scenes then of the Buddha's biography absent of his bodily presence. So none of the, um, the, the scenes at Sanchi that depict the, the life of the Buddha contain images of the Buddha in figurative form. Rather, his presence is indicated by footprints, which you see in this image on the extreme right, or by an empty space underneath the parasol, which I've also highlighted. Importantly, at this time, image-based practices served worldly needs, such as vanqu vanquishing a foe or attracting the attentions of a lover, but not transcendent or spiritual aims. As Buddhist devotions began to accommodate the image of the Buddha, the plan and iconography of the Deccan monastery changed accordingly. But I do wanna emphasize that the inclusion of image-based modes of worship as a result of philosophical shifts regarding the ontology of divinity was a pan-South Asian phenomenon and was also seen in the Brahmanical and Jaina context as well. So it was not uh, exclusive to Buddhism. And I'll return to that subject shortly. For the moment, let me highlight that the very position of the relief stupa in Nasik's viharas is subsumed by the chamber of the Buddha in monasteries of the fifth and later centuries. Literary and epigraphic sources call this chamber the Gandhakuti or perfume chamber. To clarify further what I mean, in early Buddhist monasteries, an apsidal worship hall or chaitya, and we've seen chaityas, integrated a rock cut stupa and a separate square vihara served as the monks living quarters. But in the new plan, which we begin to see around the fifth century, Monks could worship and congregate in the very same spaces in which they lived, and they congregated around a Buddha image in the perfume chamber. Buddhist texts in Pali and Sanskrit contain redolent accounts of, this, of how the scented milieu was fashioned for the Buddha. They tell us that the Buddha resided in sweetly scented spaces perfumed by floral offerings, sandalwood, incense, and other aromatic substances, and that he even flew in floral bowers to other fragrant spaces. I actually love that image of the Buddha flying uh, in, in floral bowers. John Strong remarks that the offerings not only gave the chamber its name, but also transformed any ordinary space into the Buddha's own chamber, his own perfume chamber. The Nasik Vihara most likely, and, I'm, and I want you to see this image one more time, the Nasik Vihara most likely represents an intermediate step between the early Buddhist complexes, which did not contain perfume chambers, and later Buddhist monasteries, which do contain perfume chambers. The most striking difference is the introduction of a chamber for a Buddha image where the Nasik stupa image stands. And just as importantly for our discussion here, our, so our sources suggest that the Buddhist community made no distinction between the Buddha image in the perfume chamber and the person of the Buddha. And that's a really important point. By the fourth and by the fourth to fifth century CE, inscriptions state with greater and greater clarity that not only monks, but the Buddha himself was a resident at monasteries. The Buddha was considered a legal person and corporate head of the resident monastic community and received gifts and other endowments directly. In other words, medieval Buddhists saw as Robert de Coroli has put it, quote, a profound equivalency between image and subject, unquote. At Ajanta, the important fifth century CE Deccan monastery, an inscription at cave 16, which is a vihara, refers to the whole space as, quote, the excellent dwelling to be occupied by the best of ascetics, unquote. I hope it's clear by now that this best of ascetics was none other than the Buddha. Intriguingly, the disposition and location of the perfume chamber follows the Buddha's own instructions, which go like this. If you have three cells made, the perfume chamber is to be made in the middle. 
the two other cells should be on each side. Likewise, if there are nine cells and three wings in a quadrangular vihara, the perfume chamber is to be placed in the middle of the back wall facing the main entrance with two cells on each side of the main entrance. This excerpt contains many important clues for us. First, of course, these prescriptions situate the Buddha's chamber at the locus of the monastic residence. Second, they correspond precisely with the perfume chambers at Ajanta and other later Deccan monasteries. Equally importantly, the spatial disposition of Nasik stupa images correspond, corresponds with these specifications for the Buddha's perfume chamber. Returning to Nasik, we see that the stupa image of Vihara 3 is at the center of the back wall with three monk cells on either side, and it faces the main entrance. Likewise, in Vihara 10, sculpture, sculptors position the stupa image at the center of the resonance hall across from the entrance with three monk cells on either side. So what does all this mean for our stupa images? Since the Buddha image was perceived as the Buddha and thought to live, receive gifts, and even die in the perfume chamber, I, I argue, I want to suggest that images of stupas, like those at Nasik, particularly those in the monastery's plan directly associated with the Buddha's person must have been understood as stupas and not as representations or reenactments of those buildings. It's also useful to think about the Sanskrit about the semantic associations of the Sanskrit term pratima that epigraphs employ in connection with Buddha and Bodhisattva imagery. Gre Gregory Chopin has argued that medieval Buddhist practitioners understood the semantic category as embodiments of those beings or the presences of those beings rather than in the sense of representation or signifier that the English word image implies. In his analysis of land grants from the Deccan, Central India, Western India and beyond, Chopin writes that, quote, the drafters of these grants and all the inscriptions never use a word which could, however unsuitably be translated by image. They talk about persons, not objects, and these persons, like the monks who are to be provided for, always live in monasteries." Unquote. From our vantage point, we need to make several cognitive leaps to take us from the stupa images to the Buddha. We must equate the stupa image with the freestanding stupa. We must equate the stupa with the Buddha. And finally, the stupa image with the person of the Buddha. One concrete materialization of the equivalency between the stupa image and the Buddha comes from Nasik itself. And I'm taking you back now to Vihara 10. Because here the stupa image in Vihara 10 was transformed into an anthropomorphic form at an uncertain date. So I want you to look carefully at the image here on the right which would have been an image of a stupa, but now is a figural image. The stupa's drum and dome, its body as it were, have been refashioned into a standing male figure, presumably as a result of later developments in the vihara's use. The harmika, the inverted stepped pyramid, and the parasols were left unaltered. So that's this top portion here. These symbols of authority and veneration have simply been reoriented to hover above the figural image. Other signs also point to reuse. The female attendant's feet would have aligned with the stupa's base as they, were, as they do at Vihara 3, but here they levitate near the central human figure's hips. 
Although we don't know the exact time period of this transformation, and while it's possible that the figure could represent a Brahmanical deity and not the Buddha, it nonetheless suggests pan-Indian shifts in conceptions of the divine and points to the material practices that accompanied such ontological shifts. Comparing the facades of the Nasik worship hall with the facades of the worship halls at Ajanta is also valuable for thinking about shifts in how divinity was conceived and given material form. Nasik's worship hall, which you're looking at, is dated to the first century CE. And the, and the Ajanta worship hall that I'll show you is from the second part of the fifth century. At Nasik, notice that stupa images adorn the facade of Nasik's first century hall. So you can see the stupa images here. They're not that clear, but they're there. And they appear between pilasters and within the frames of horseshoe arches. There's no figural imagery here, except for depictions of door guardians and some zoomorphic imagery. By contrast, multitudes of Buddha images in a variety of postures populate the facades of Ajanta's fifth century worship halls. Another difference is that, is that at Nasik, the stupa images are enframed by architectural spaces. By contrast, at Ajanta's Cave 26, architectural representations do not appear independently, but only as frames for Buddha images. This is not to say that the image of the Buddha eclipses the stupa image at, at Ajanta, but rather that the two coexist and are semantically equivalent. Let me now make a few points by way of conclusion. In recent years, historians of religion have observed that arguments against image worship within Asian religious traditions have received short shrift. We've largely ignored the ways in which Buddhism and Hinduism struggled with and made room for the worship of images. Image worship, as Phyllis Granoff and Koichi Shinohara have argued, quote, was more problematic than we may have realized. Its centrality did not go unquestioned, unquote. Scholars have also argued that our notion of religious image should accommodate an array of objects, both natural and fabricated, beyond the anthropomorphic. Such ritual items as beads, lamps, bells, and coconuts, as well as processional vehicles and garments could all be sacralized by religious practice to attain the status of venerated works. It's in this expanded sense of the ontology of the image and within the context of transitions from image averse to image centric modes of worship in early historic South Asia that I suggest we view images of architecture. Interestingly, the earliest stupa images were produced in the period from the early centuries BCE to the second century CE when attitudes toward toward images began to expand and gave rise to new forms of image worship. While the existence of the aniconic period of Buddhism has been hotly contested, it's only relatively recently that we, that scholars, have turned our attention to these uncharted and emerging image practices. What I'm saying here is that attending to the semantics and reception of the architectural representation during this historical moment could shed further light on how early historic Buddhists and others constituted images and understood their efficacy and agency. In the wider book project from which this talk is drawn, I consider the myriad ways in which architectural representations worked in Buddhist, Hindu, and Jaina contexts. They worked as imaginative resources for makers, they demarcated sacred space, and they completed and endowed spaces with efficacy, and they operated as signs of prestige, status, and other social differences. And they also worked, of course, as at Nasik, as independent objects of veneration in their own right. The ontology of the religious image must make room then for the architectural representation. Thank you so much for listening. Our thanks to Subhashini. 
And I want to mention our next lecture in this series, Art, Environment and Materiality Along the Silk Roads, will be on December 16th, so next month, at 7 p.m. Eastern time, so same time. So that's Thursday, same day, December 16th at 7 p.m. Eastern time, same time. Our speaker will be Wen Xing Zhou, who is the Associate Professor of Art History at Hunter College, the City University of New York. Um, she'll be speaking on the art of pilgrimage to Mount Wutai, and further information is forthcoming. So to our viewers, thank you so much for joining us here this evening. We greatly appreciate you and all your support and encouragement and coming out time after time to join us. It means so much to us. Um, once more, a tremendous thank you to Sebastian for her illuminating uh, explication of how stupas were perceived by early Buddhists. And I would like to wish you all a very pleasant evening.